Hello, everyone. Man, I'm just a little shook because that's, that song, at, that last song was something, amen? That last song was sublime, and it just took me to new places, so praise God for that. As I was listening to that song, I was thinking about the theme and what we've been building, this theme of Messiah. I was thinking about our study for, uh, for this evening, which is the high priest, and this topic, I think, is it's, it's a build on what we talked about last time for the topic of the Lamb of God that I studied with, with, uh, with you all. So we're in the high priest here, and I want to begin with a preamble, with a preamble. Imagine in your mind's eye the resurrection of Jesus. Imagine the condition of the church. Imagine, imagine the church in complete disarray. And I always thought that when Jesus resurrected from the dead, he basically made his way to some hill where his disciples were, and then he just ascends up to heaven. But in fact, when you read the Gospels, he stays behind after his resurrection. Does anybody know how long Jesus stuck around after he came back from the dead? 40 days, Forty days right? 40 days, that's over a month. That's a long time, right? And we can ask ourselves the question, why did Jesus stick around for 40 days after his resurrection? And, and the answer is right there in Acts chapter 1. It's because he needed to stick around to give undeniable affirmation to his church that he was the risen Lord, right? Now, you remember the story of Mary at the tomb, at the garden tomb, and she's weeping, and she goes to the tomb to find where they have laid the Lord, right? And she gets there, and she doesn't find him, and she's weeping and weeping, where have they, where have they buried my Lord? And then Jesus appears to the scene, right? And he's trying to console her, but she doesn't even recognize him because her, her vision has been blurred by all her tears. And then finally Jesus says, Mary, calls her by name. And she instantly remembers and recognizes his voice. And she realizes she is standing in front of Jesus. And when she comes to that realization, she's so excited that she goes to lunge and to embrace him. And you remember, remember what Jesus says? Jesus stops her and he says, don't cling to me now, Mary. Not yet. Because I have not yet ascended to my father. Remember that? I have not yet ascended to my God and to your God. Which is a really mysterious scenario there because later that same evening, we have the same Jesus, the same day, and he's in the, he's in the room where the disciples are huddled and he shows up and now they are all embracing him and touching him and clinging to him. And so something changed from that moment earlier on in that same day where he tells Mary not to cling on, onto him to later on that same evening where now the, the church is clinging to him. Are you with me? And you remember what he told her was, I had not yet ascended up to, to God. So it's super fascinating to me as a preamble to our study tonight the fact that in the interval of those few hours, Jesus ascended up to heaven on a quick emergency trip, so to speak. Have you realized this? He shoots up to heaven and, and he appears before God. And I can only imagine what that scene would have been like because for 30 odd years, the prince of heaven has been down here, right? Right? And imagine how heaven is at the, at the edge of, of, everyone is at the edge of their seat. So much is hanging, right? So much is at stake with all of this is happening. And finally, here he is at the end of this whole ordeal and he shoots up to heaven. Can you imagine Jesus entering through the gates and imagine the angels? Imagine the, the, the face on, on the angel Gabriel. Is he, maybe he's weeping and Jesus passes through the crowds and he goes straight to his father, to get confirmation that his life and his death has been a victory. And he can now go back down and look at his church in the face and say, all power has been given unto me, right? That whole scene sets us up 
to discuss Jesus' incredible role in the heavenly sanctuary as a high priest. Now, there's a statement in Acts of the Apostles that, that, brings, to, that brings to light the fact that after Jesus ascends, or as he's, before he ascends, he tells the disciples, go back to Jerusalem and wait for the power to come down. Wait to be baptized by the Spirit. And there's this incredible statement made in the book Acts of the Apostles. And it says, when Christ passed through the heavenly gates, he was enthroned amidst the adoration of the angels. As soon as this ceremony was completed, the Holy Spirit descended upon the disciples in rich currents. And Christ was indeed glorified, even with the glory which he had with the Father from all eternity. The Pentecostal outpouring was heaven's communication that the Redeemer's inauguration was accomplished. Listen to what I'm trying to say here. There was a huge party in heaven from the point that Jesus ascended and that, that lag, lag period until the Holy Spirit came down upon the church. And the reason there was a lag of 10 days, because it came, comes down on the day of Pentecost, right? The 50th day. So there's 10 extra days after that 40 initial, initial 40 day period. And the reason there's that lag is because there's an inauguration going on apparently in heaven. Some kind of inauguration is going on where Jesus is being instated in this, in this new special role. And at the conclusion of that, when the spirit comes down, it was heaven's communication that the heavenly sanctuary ministry of Jesus has been inaugurated in this particular sense. Are you with me? One scholar has pointed out that when you look at the anointing service of the high priest in the Old Testament, there's oil poured over Aaron's head and the oil drips on his beard and it drips from his beard to his garment and down the hem of his garments, right? And so you read this and, and one scholar points out that as Jesus is up in heaven during this ceremony where he's being inaugurated in this high priestly role, that he is being anointed and that oil, just as it was in the days of old, that oil pours over his head and down through his garments and then it pours down to earth and it catches fire on the head of the disciples that are huddled in Jerusalem. So there's all this imagery here that we get that sets the stage here for this idea that Christ is the high priest, this messianic motif that becomes hugely important in scripture of Christ's role in this sense. So we are immediately brought to the significance of the tabernacle, because we've been talking, as we've been talking about this priest, you know, motif, we're talking sanctuary language, sanctuary uh, uh, lingo here. And so the, the, the Bible, not only throughout the Old Testament, but into the New Testament, and I'm going to get to this in a second, even into the book of Revelation, this idea of the tabernacle becomes the prism through which we understand the entire story of redemption. Now, it's interesting because when Moses, right, when Genesis is penned, there are two chapters devoted to the creation of the world. Two chapters. I don't know about you, but there's, a, there's probably a whole lot to talk about when we're talking about the creation of the world as you and I know it. All the chemistry, all the, all the physics, all the there's, there's a lot to talk about. And Moses just speeds through that in two chapters. But here's the funny thing. Shortly after that, he devotes 50 long chapters to describing the construction, the dimensions, the colors of the sanctuary of the tabernacle. Okay. It's as if Moses is just, and, and God created the world in, in, in the most incredible, amazing information that we would all be spellbound by. He's like, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and then he gets to the sanctuary. He stops for 50 long chapters. He's like, now, let me tell you about the curtains. Let me tell you about the fabric because it will blow your mind. We're like, no, go back to Genesis 2 and blow our minds back there. Amen? Am I the only one that thinks like this? I argue with the prophets all the time. It's kind of hilarious. And why spend all this time? Why all this detail on, on this tent? Why spend all this attention and energy in describing some, 
some tent in the wilderness. And the reason is, as we, as we, are we will discover, is that what we see in these physical structures down here on earth are peepholes that are simply trying to draw our attention as best as they can to eternal realities in the heavenly sanctuary. And the details are significant because the details are drawing attention to all of the layers and all of the dimensions of what it means when we think about the priestly ministry of Jesus. And to give you one example, in this tabernacle, we have a little tent inside. And that little tent is divided into these two compartments, right? And tonight, we're just going to focus on getting to that second compartment that the Bible calls the Holy of Holies, the most holy place, right? And inside that compartment, we have an ark, a box. And this is the Ark of the Covenant, and there's a lid on top of it that the Bible calls the mercy seat. And on top of that lid are these two angels, and these two angels the Bible calls, I forget, what is it? Cherubims, right? And these cherubims are angels with special roles, now, it's super interesting, I think, just as an example of why these details are there, why these details matter. Because these two cherubim have a long history in Scripture. And in fact, I want to suggest to you that, that when you look at these pieces of furniture, they hint at behind the scenes of what's happening in the cosmic conflict between good and evil. For example, the cherubims... Remind me of Ezekiel chapter 28, where we're given a glimpse before the fall of Lucifer. And he's described this way. You were the seal of what, everybody? Perfection. So we're talking here now. We're, we're talking here pre-fall, right? You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. You were the anointed cherub who covers I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created until iniquity was found in you. So just, just catch this for one second. The cherubim had a special function. They were to hover over or, or guard the law of God that was inside of the Ark of the Covenant. And here we're told that Lucifer... The leader of the, of, 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 of the rebellion was a cherub. So this, I think, just, just sends my imagination running, right? It tells us something profound about the great controversy uh, between good and evil because the rebellion takes place and the leader of the rebellion is someone in this lofty position that was meant to hover over the law of God, which is the transcript of his character. And so on the offset, just by looking at a piece of furniture we get insights into what is at the heart of the controversy. It has to do with some kind of rebellion that has to do in some way with the transcript of God's very character. Are you with me? And so you have all these things, these layers throughout the Old Testament, which we're not really spending time uh, tonight. But this is the reason why Moses puts the brakes on and he decides that he needs to really talk about this chapter after chapter after chapter because for some reason this is important. But I want to bring you back. Because two days ago or so, we were talking about the lamb in the book of Revelation. And I made a big deal about how the book of Revelation mentions the lamb more than any other book in Scripture. That the lamb referring to Jesus is the title given to Jesus more than any other title in the book of Revelation. And so the book of Revelation is really not about dragons and beasts and horns. But the book of Revelation is really tracking the activities of the Lamb. But I want to add another dimension tonight. Because the book of Revelation is not just about the Lamb. It's about the Lamb and the priest. And what we'll note is that the book of Revelation is laid out in sanctuary motif, sanctuary language. And the way it introduces Jesus... It places Jesus in the sanctuary. Now, in Revelation chapter 1, this is just background. I won't bog you down with the details. We are introduced to the Son of Man. The book opens up with a vision of John looking at the Son of Man, looking at the Christ. 
and it begins to describe Jesus and it describes him and his attire. He's dressed in a robe. He has a golden sash. And then it goes into all kinds of spiritual descriptions. And it really wants us to know what Jesus is wearing. It wants us to understand the appearance of Jesus. And the reason it wants us to understand that is because Jesus is presented in high priestly attire. And aside from what he's wearing, Jesus is placed in the midst of the lampstand. This is sanctuary motif. So the whole thing is about two things, about a lamb and about a priest. And for redemption to make any sense to us, you need two things in the sanctuary. You need a lamb and you need a priest. And I want to draw attention to this this idea of the, um, the attire of the priest. Because in the biblical world, unlike our world, attire meant more than just fashion, right? So we can draw a distinction here. Fashion versus function, right? In the old world, in the ancient world, in the Greco-Roman world, uh, what people had on in their attire, it it signified their position. It it was an extension of their personality, of their position in society, et cetera, et cetera. And we see some of that in our world today. But in the ancient world, it was way more pronounced than that. And so we don't get a long, uh, involved argument about Jesus is the high priest, and these are the arguments why. In fact, Revelation does not even enter into those arguments about Jesus being the high priest. It simply tells you what he's wearing, okay? And by telling you what he's wearing, it's making the argument for us. And the reason I'm emphasizing that is because we'll look at in the Old Testament, there's so much uh, attention given to the, to the high, high priestly attire. And it all is representative of Jesus's role and the, 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 the nuances and the dimensions of what Jesus means to humanity in his, in his priestly ministry. Now, there is a fascinating uh, account in the, in the work of Josephus. Josephus was a historian in the first century. Josephus was not a Christian. And Josephus writes down, just to give us a sense about the high priestly uh, uh, attire, he tells us that... Um, Alexander the Great was marching into Jerusalem after conquering different, different uh, nation states, different empires. He's approaching Jerusalem to sack Jerusalem. Word gets back to the priests in Jerusalem and they all begin to panic because the great Alexander is coming their way and they have no defense. So they enter and they start praying. And the priest receives this this answer in his prayer that says, go meet Alexander and don't be afraid. And so they all get together and the high priest is there along with this other priest and they go out to meet Alexander the Great as he approaches. Now here's what Josephus says about this story. He says that as Alexander the Great approaches the group of priests, high priest and the other priests, he's blown away. Because he realizes that he himself had a a dream and he saw the high priest, specifically his robe, in his dream. And when he approaches the the delegation, he recognizes that same robe. And it's because of the robe of the high priest that Alexander doesn't completely sack Jerusalem. The priests come and one of the other priests hand him a scroll. This is Josephus talking. Hand him a scroll of the book of Daniel. And they open up the scroll and they take him to Daniel chapter 8 and they read to him the prophecy of the empire, of the Greek empire, and of that horn that was going to conquer. And Alexander reads this prophecy from the the scroll of Daniel and immediately he recognizes that it's speaking about himself. So this is uh, just an example for you of how... uh, the literature in, 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 in the Jewish world and the rabbis go on and on and on and on describing the priest and, and, and the attire and the robes. Now, you can believe that if, if you want. Um, but the point is this, that, that the, um, the, the clothing and the, enti- and the attire denotes function. So if you see somebody with scrubs, you think, oh, they're a health care worker. If you see somebody with a, with a you know, with a blue uniform, right? The blue, right? He's a police officer, right? Your attire denotes your function. And so this is super true when it comes to the sanctuary. So as we, as we look at this, 
um, I should say that the Bible doesn't give us a perfect list of everything that the priest was wearing, but it does pay most attention to the actual role of the priest. And here's one word that we need to remember when we think about the priest. It's just one word. It's the word atonement, and you'll see it here. This is Leviticus 16 describing the function of the priest. And the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron not to come at just any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat, which is on the ark, lest he die. For I will appear in the cloud above the mercy seat. We just talked about that. The lid and the mercy seat and the cherubim. So he shall make, there's our word, atonement. Because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions for all their sins, so so he shall do for the tabernacle of meeting, which remains among them in the midst of their uncleanness. So the central role of the priest was to get blood inside of the sanctuary. And this is why I said earlier, in order for the sinner to be reconciled with God, he or she needs two things, a lamb and a priest, because the lamb allows you to transfer your sin to the innocent substitute. But it doesn't get your sin inside of the sanctuary. and You're not allowed in the Holy of Holies. And so the priest is necessary. So you need the two things. You need the lamb and the priest. And what we're, what we're breaking down tonight is that Jesus functions as both the lamb and the priest. So check this out. It's beautiful descriptions of, of what, what he's wearing. All right, this is all from the Old Testament. Check this out, the ephod. It's like an apron. And on the apron, we have all these details, as I've mentioned. Why? Check this out. This is the instructions on what, what the priest wears. Exodus 28. Then you shall take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel. And you shall put the two stones on the shoulders of the ephod as memorial stones for the sons of Israel. And so Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord on his two shoulders as a memorial. So, so process here, all of these little details are, are representative of what the priest is doing in a spiritual sense. He has two stones and engraved on those two stones are the names of the tribes of Israel. And the symbolism is obvious. He is appearing before the presence of God. They're all outside in tents, right? Hoping and praying everything goes well. He's inside the presence of God with these two stones on his shoulders. And the symbolism is he is carrying, he is carrying the people on his shoulders. And again, Josephus tells us that these stones were magnificent, that they were beautiful, and that you couldn't buy them because of their immense value, these onyx stones on the shoulders. There is a news report of a couple, husband and wife, in South Africa, who have said that in their family line, they have inherited one of these onyx stones. And they said it's 3,000 years old, and they said that they're ready now to make it public. And so they sent out some, some historian scholar, and he's analyzing it, and he sees that inside the stone is sketched in Hebrew, right? And he can't, they can't figure out how that sketch got inside of the stone because it's not altered in the surface. And, and now suddenly um, this couple comes public, and they want to, you know, make it known. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I'm... I'm super skeptical to a fault, right? I don't believe anything about anything until it's absolutely proven. Like when my wife and I go to these trips, these archaeology trips or these historical sites, there's, this, there's a, a tourist guide and I am the worst nightmare for any tourist guide <laughs> because they're going blah, 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 blah. And this here, everybody, you know, they do the white eye thing. This here is the very stone or the very crown that so-and-so historical, and I'm the guy in the back like, are you sure? <laughs> or I'll be like, what's your source material on that? And my wife is like, oh my goodness. <laughs> or I'll be like, <clears throat> allegedly, right? So I don't know if I buy this story, but it's, it's, it's definitely fascinating. So, so Josephus talks about this immense value. Oh, by the way, it's up for sale for $250 million. <laughs> Not sketchy at all. Not sketchy at all. So on, this, on the shoulders of, 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 of the priest are, are these two stones, and it symbolizes carrying the people, carrying the burden on his 
shoulders. And then there's the breastplate. There's the breastplate that the priest has. And we're told so much detail that there are stones on the breastplate of the priest. And on these stones are engraved, again, the 12 tribes of Israel by name. And not, not, not one of the stones is the same as another. They're, per, they're perfectly unique. And you read this in, in Exodus. Here are the instructions. You shall make the breastplate of judgment and the stones shall be the names of the sons of Israel. 12 of them corresponding to their names and the engravings, each one according to his name. And Aaron shall bear the names of the sons of Israel on the breastplate of judgment over his what? Over his heart. You see, it, he's, it, these are parables, right? Over his heart. And um, we could read this all day. So Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel over his heart before the Lord continually. So there you have it. So th th these are depictions of what the priests would wear. And it was supposed to communicate to the people that this is your representative. As you approach the holiness of God, this priest carries the people on his shoulders and he carries the people by name over his heart. So when he appears before the Lord and the Lord looks at him, the Lord is seeing the representative of the people. And it's really a beautiful thing. And I've wondered, why do you need these duplicate names? I mean, you have the names on the shoulder, six here, six here for the 12 tribes. And then you have 12 stones 12 tribes again, and this repetition, right? And you wonder why the duplicate listings. And so on the chest, on the breastplate, the individual stones represent the individuality, right? Of every single individual in the camp of Israel. But then on the shoulders, they're grouped together because we do not, we not only need to understand our individual value to God, but our collective value to God. You follow what I'm saying? So those are the two dimensions that we see in the... Uh, in the attire of the priest. And none of this really matters in Exodus and in Leviticus and in Deuteronomy if it just ended there, amen? The whole point of all of this, the punchline of all of this is that it was pointing forward to Christ as our high priest. And so we can get to the point, right? We can get to the point. And the point, when you get to the New Testament, is absolutely glorious. Because when the New Testament writers are standing on the shoulders of this rich history and they're looking at the Christ event, this, this event that just burst into their world where Jesus shows up as the fulfillment of all of this backstory. They write about Christ and all of the things that he means as the high priest. And there's this one word I wanna to emphasize tonight and that is the word surety. Because when Paul talks about in Hebrews chapter seven that Jesus is the surety, right? Jesus as our priest is the surety of a better covenant. Let's talk about that for a second. In the book of Hebrews, where we're told that Jesus is the high priest, it's, it's constantly using the word better, 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 better. Yes, there was Moses, but, but here's better. Yes, there was the, the past, but this is better, right? And so Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. And so we ask the question, what is better about this covenant? And in, in the Bible, you have the priests who were of the tribe of, what was, what was what were the, Levi, right? And the reason the priests get to be priests is because they happen to be born in the right tribe. Yeah. What qualifies them to the priesthood is their genealogy. Are you with me? Notice what is not the criterion for their priesthood. It's not their experience. It's not necessarily their usefulness. It's not their talent. Are you with me? And so Jesus comes into the picture and he's announced to the world as the priest, but there's one slight problem that the book of Hebrews recognizes. What's that problem? Jesus is coming from the wrong tribe. Are you with me? And so the book of Hebrews builds this incredible theological treatise to argue that exact point. Jesus came from the wrong tribe. Jesus came from the wrong tribe. And the reason it does that is because it wants to argue a very specific, uh, very specific point. And that is, if Jesus is coming from the wrong tribe, then his qualifications for being priests have nothing to do with genealogy. Wow. Which begs the question, 
if it has nothing to do with genealogy, what are the qualifications based on? Is that a good question? The entire book is an answer to that question. What are those qualifications? And the qualification is powerful. So this is Hebrews chapter 5. This is Hebrews explaining, hey, in the Old Testament, this is, this is how the priest was selected. Every high priest is chosen from where, everybody? Among men, from the people themselves, and is appointed to act on behalf of men, right? Of the people in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices. Why is it important for the priest to come from the very community he is representing? It tells you right there. So that he can deal, how everybody? Gently with the ignorant and the wayward, since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. So the, the, the key characteristic of the priest is that he's taken from among the people. That makes him sim sympathetic to the needs and the struggles of the community because he is one of them. You with me? And that fact, that bond that he has, it's what qualifies the priest, right? In his priesthood, it was important. When we get to Jesus, this is the argument of Hebrews. What were his qualifications? The, the, the uh, incarnation of Christ becomes the central qualification because he's not, just, he's not just a member of a tribe. He's not even just a member of the nation of Israel. Christ takes on human nature in total, right? This is what becomes one of his qualifications. Among the people, I want you to remember that. Among the people, among the people, among the people. In fact, uh, let me share something with you a little personal. Do you guys know... Um, you guys know who this gentleman is here? Having his head anointed? That's actually my uncle. Really? This is Padre Luis Rosario. And he's being uh, an, uh, ordained by Pope Paul the, the VI in the 70s. Now, here's the interesting thing. He just passed away very recently. He just passed away. And, and as I'm thinking about the high priest, I'm thinking about my family members that are in other faith communities, right? And here's the central thing. He becomes known as the priest of the people. The priest of the people because he spends his entire life serving in the most impoverished section of Santo Domingo in the Dominican Republic. And he walks around uh, in regular common clothes, mingling with the people. And he becomes, he, he becomes this, this symbol uh, in the country of somebody who's among the people. So as I was studying the... Uh, the subject of the high priest and how it's among the people, among the people. I'm beginning to, 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 to look at this and to think about this. Even in, in this example, if, even in this earthly example with, with, with my uncle from another faith community, we see that that is the central characteristic that was important in his priesthood. And this is the president of the Dominican Republic. I'm flexing now. Can you tell? <laughs> this is the president of the Dominican Republic uh, announcing the death of my of my uncle and the Dominican Congress had a moment of silence to commemorate him. And it was all because he was perceived to be somebody who was among the people. Are you with me? So that is a central characteristic. Now Hebrews continues, check this out. Chapters two verses 17 through 18. Therefore in all things, Jesus had to be made like his brethren that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people, for in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. That's such a beautiful depiction, yes, yes. a beautiful New Testament fulfillment of these ancient uh, passages we were reading in Exodus, where it talks about the priest and, and he's walking in to the presence of God, carrying the burden of the people. But the, the, the passage I wanna, I wanna really emphasize is in Hebrews chapter four. Now check this out, because I've been thinking about this lately. Here's the buildup for this. This will be familiar to some of you. Seeing that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are. What's the rest of that? Yes. Yet without sin. But was in all points tempted as we are. 
What does that mean? Was in all points tempted, tempted as we are. How could Jesus, who lived at a specific moment in history, in a specific place, at a time where his world was very different to our world, how could Jesus claim to have been tempted in all points as we are? Was Jesus ever a 22-year-old young man in Miami, Florida in 2023? Was Jesus ever a 42-year-old single mom in the Bronx? How can Jesus say, how can Scripture say that Jesus was tempted in all points as we are? Have you ever thought about that? Am I the only one that's, that's thought about that? How is that possible? And the reason it's possible is because the text is not saying that in every permutation example you can imagine, Jesus had to assume that role in order to be able to relate to us. But that in, 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 in the categories of temptation, right, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, right, temptation as a whole, check this out, Jesus never gave in. And so Jesus experienced the full force of the, how can I put this? The temptation meter was cranked up all the way up, right? You and I have never experienced temptation with the temptation meter cranked up all the way up. And so Jesus' temptation covers every possible temptation. Let me, let me, let me say it this way. The reason I know that you and I have not been tempted, we have not, we have not faced Satan toe-to-toe -to -toe at full force, ever. Here's how I know. Because before that temptation meter makes it to full force, you and I cave in way before it reaches that maximum. Can you say amen to that? The devil never has to crank it up all the way. Because if you're anything like me, I cave in way low in that meter. And so I've never tasted what it looks like to bing, 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 bing at the very high. You follow what I'm saying? But you're probably thinking, wait a second. But there have been some temptations that I've resisted. Has there been, can you think of any temptation you've ever resisted? Right? Of course. And if there has been some temptation, doesn't that then mean that I have, that he did have to crank it up all the way up? But, but the answer is no. And how do I know no? Because even for the temptations that you and I believe that we have resisted, those temptations were rigged in your favor. Amen. What do I mean? Here's what I mean by that. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful who will not let you be tempted, listen to what he's saying, beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. What's the point? Whenever a temptation even reaches your orbit... It has already been determined. It's been weighed against your ability. And if it outweighs your ability, it is intercepted. And it never even enters your orbit. So those temptations you believe you've resisted, those temptations were rigged in your favor. The only stuff that slips through the crack is the stuff that's under the careful, watchful eye of your high priest. Come on now. We have never tasted the full force because we caved in or it's been rigged in our favor. We have an interceptor. Now, here's the punch. Jesus never sinned. Which means Jesus experienced the full force. Temptation meter cranked up full max. Every day of his entire life. Now, bump that. Every second of his entire life. Now try to process that one. Right? And here's the second part. There were no interceptors for Jesus. No, he did not. There was no interceptor. Nothing was rigged. In his favor. So when we say, when we say the, the, what we're saying here, that Jesus was tempted in all points as we were. You guys follow what I'm saying? This is what that means. 
And C.S. Lewis's incredible statement, David and I were talking about this earlier today. It says this incredible statement. Check this out. No man knows how bad he is till he has tried very hard to be good. <laughs> A silly idea is current that good people don't really know what temptation means, right? You know those people that are, that are really holy? You know some of them? Any of you know some righteous folk? They're really holy. And you're like, oh, they don't really know the struggle. They don't even know the struggle, right? That's a bunch of baloney, right? It's a silly idea that they don't know what temptation really means. It's an obvious lie, Lewis says. Why? Only those who try to resist temptation know how strong it is, right? After all, you find out the strength of the German army. He's writing, by the way, during World War II, so... You find out the strength of the German army by fighting against it, not by giving in. You find out the strength of a wind by trying to walk against it, not by lying down. A man who gives in to temptation after five minutes, that's yours truly, simply does not know what it would have been like in an hour, an hour later. That is why bad people, <laughs> in one sense, know very little about badness. They have lived in a sheltered life by always giving in. <laughs> oh, he's not done. He's not done. I'm almost done, but he's not done. We never find out the strength of the evil impulse inside of us until we try to fight it. And here we go. You ready? This is the gospel. We're, we're going to land the plane here soon. So you ready? Christ, because he was the only man who never yielded to temptation, is also the only man who knows the f in f to the full what temptation actually means. The only complete realist. Jesus was not a 22-year-old uh, teen pregnancy in the Bronx. Yeah, Jesus was not a, a, a young guy in Miami beset with the temptations of 2023 and the internet and whatever. He was none of that. But Jesus had the full force of what temptation actually means. And by conquering that, it covers every possible permutation, every possible scenario you could imagine. And Jesus covers it all. That, my friends, is the qualification that you want for your high priest. Say, can you say amen to that? That's the qualifications. On earth, Christ represented God before humanity. He goes up to heaven to represent humanity before God. He is the one responsible for or guaranteeing the performance of the covenant. Listen to what I'm saying. Jesus is the guarantee that this, this, this scenario, this agreement, will succeed. Um, have you guys heard preachers do these cheesy sermon illustrations? Like, you're driving, in, you're driving you get pulled over by a cop, and, and uh, you're under the law, right? And he, he's going to issue you a traffic ticket, but then he forgives you, and, and now you're under grace. And so when you keep driving now, you're going to keep the speed limit because now you're under grace and not under the law. Have you guys heard that before? If you're really church folk, you've heard that before. Because everybody says it, right? I was speeding in California, got pulled over. I was on my way to, to a, you know, we're always, it's always important, right? I got pulled over. I get a speeding ticket. I think it's not fair. I look, it's like 250 bucks. I get home and I log on to, to, to the website and it says, you can actually appeal this. I'm like, heck yes, I'm going to appeal this. How do you appeal this? You got to write a letter to the judge through the clerk, uh, something court clerk. I literally wrote a letter. And in my letter, I said, uh, Mr. Judge, I want to appeal for your grace and for your mercy. And I gave him Bible verses. I know. I'm not proud of this. I gave him a Bible study in the letter. My wife will attest to this. I'm not lying. This is not a made up story. 
I gave him a Bible study in the letter. I said, the Bible says we need to, that grace is important. The Bible says we ought to be merciful. The Bible says that Jesus forgives sinners. The Bible says, and I sent it off, right? I sent it off. Like, I mean, what, why not? Kid you not, a response letter comes back to me a couple of days ago. And I get the letter and I hold it and I'm like, no way, no way. I'm going to be like, this is bragging rights galore among my preacher friends. I didn't give the illustration. I lived the thing, right? Um, and I open it up and I'm like, oh, my heart's racing. And you know what it says? You can pay by credit card or by check. <laughs> now, I wanted to say, I'm not paying for nothing. Come find me if you can. I didn't say that. So, um, no mercy. My letter, I was saying, hey, I get it. I, I get it, but have mercy. I, I promise you it will never happen again. I say that with a grin on my face. It will never happen. If you forgive me for this, I will never speed again. Here's the problem, folks. Here's the problem. What guarantee does this judge have that any of that is true? There's zero guarantee. I need someone in that clerk's office, right? With some kind of credentials that can guarantee that Jeffrey will fulfill his end of this agreement. Are you guys tracking what I'm saying? I need, I need a mediator <laughs> to be in there to, to guarantee the performance of this on my behalf. Because short of that, I'm absolutely hopeless. And so no mercy. I'm not over it yet, can you tell? I'm gonna write a follow-up email and I'm gonna say, how dare you? With what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And may the Lord hold you accountable in the great day of judgment. <laughs> Jesus is the guarantee, not only on the, on the part of God, but on the part of humanity. This is it, this is it. It's like a couple more slides, we're done. The death of Jesus, listen to this, all that mumbo jumbo about priests in the Old Testament, this is the point. His death gives assurance to humanity that God's going to go the whole way, okay? Guarantees it, but his life guarantees to heaven that humanity will go the whole way because in Christ... We can cling to the government. You guys follow what I'm saying? He guarantees, he, he, he's a connecting link. He's a guarantee to God and he's a guarantee to humanity. Preachers say all the time, it's all about Jesus. How cliche. My friends, it's all about Jesus. <laughs> Amen? It's all about Jesus. And um, this is the closer. I've said that three times already. Steps to Christ. Many are inquiring. Okay, this is your high priest. Hold on to this. Many are inquiring. How am I to make the surrender of myself to God? You desire to give yourself to God, but you're weak in moral power. Anybody here weak in moral power? Am I the only one? I'm weak in moral power. I'm a slave to doubt. And I'm controlled by the habits of my life of sin. Oh, what about this line? Your promises and resolutions are like ropes of sand. How's that for an image for you? You cannot control your thoughts. You cannot control your impulses or your affections. The knowledge of your broke, listen, the knowledge of your broken promises, the knowledge of them, and your forfeited pledges weakens your confidence in your own sincerity and it causes you to feel that God cannot accept you. But you need not despair. Can you say that again? But you need not, what everybody? Despair. Why you need not despair? Because we have a high priest that has entered into the, into the heavenly sanctuary who is pleading our case. We have a high priest who are, is our representative and every person's name somehow 
is carried on his, over his heart, remember? And is carried on his shoulders. And Jesus is the guarantee both to God and to humanity that you, my brother, my sister, that you are going to be able to cling to the covenant faithfulness of God. How many of you want to say praise God for our high priest? Amen. Thank you.